Okay, we are live now. Pranita, you can start. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, hello from ESR and IDC. Uh, so today we have with us Kim Lane from Postman. So as you all know, Postman is now the world's leading collaboration platform for API development. And Postman simplifies each step of building an API and streamlines collaboration so you can create better APIs faster. So today we have with us Kim Lane, who's popularly known as the API evangelist, who is who's also the chief evangelist at Postman. He has been actively studying the technology, business, and politics of APIs and spreading the words about APIs. So in his role as the API evangelist, Kim has spoken with everyone from startups to enterprises, as well as government agencies, international banks, and even the European Commission to help them figure out everything about APIs. So I'll, uh, I'll hand over the stage to Kim now. We'll talk about Postman and how it can be used to streamline the API process. So Kim? Yeah. Uh, great. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I guess uh, my name is Kim Lane, and uh, I don't need to introduce myself, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here, happy to be representing Postman and talking to you today about APIs. So why we're here today talking about APIs is because there's been this explosion in APIs over the last 20 years, uh, powering almost everything we've seen that's changed with the coming of the internet. And this is just a small sample of all of the different types of APIs that have evolved since 2000. But Postman started uh, as a business around 2012, 2013, and really noticed as this line was, was growing rapidly and the number of APIs out there were increasing. And developers like me were needing to understand what was going on with APIs and how to use them and how to how to make sense of them. All of this has led to three shifts, three big things that have happened. One is the mobile phones in our pockets. So APIs power everything on our mobile phones. Uh, APIs have also changed how we build software, not just on mobile phones, but on our desktops and on the web, leading to what's called microservices and making software much smaller, much easier to use. And then the third shift is around the cloud. So the cloud is, is hard to, to understand and quantify sometimes, but the cloud is how you run your servers, how you store data, how you uh, run services in the cloud, and APIs are how, what makes that possible. So all three of these shifts are, are related and connected and APIs are how that connection occurs. So first, what is an API? Let's start with the basics so that we can help you understand what an API is. It stands for Application Programming Interface, but after 20 years, most people simply call it just an API. But an API can mean many different things to many different people. So it helps to have an understanding of how we got here and how APIs are being used. So the web is made for humans to browse in our browsers. It's built of HTML that then gets rendered to make it more visually appealing to our eyes so that we can look at a website. I have Instagram here um, as the website, but Instagram allows me to uh, look at images, look at my friends, see the messages and comments. All of that is defined as HTML and allows us to uh, render these images and these actions in a browser so that humans can use them. APIs are used for all other applications and they started using XML, which is a is a markup language to describe data. And that data then gets shown in other applications. And it's up to whoever builds that application to uh, render it to the screen so that humans can see it. So it's a little bit different than we're used to with the HTML, but it's oftentimes the exact same data and the exact same information. Uh, once mobile phones came out, 
we started needing a more lightweight, easier to use data format. And JSON is what became the, 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 the format of choice for developers when it comes to publishing APIs. So most APIs you'll come across today return JSON instead of HTML or XML. But APIs are just using the web. They're nothing, they're not a new uh, company specific thing. They're just the next generation of the web. Uh, it's just not meant for human eyes. It's meant for developers to build other applications from the data and the information. But everything else is the same. It uses the same mechanism, HTTP, HTTPS. It uses domains and paths, but APIs are meant for building many different applications. Postman allows you to work with both. And I'll show you a little bit more how Postman works in a little bit. But Postman allows you to make calls to websites or to APIs and then see those results and be able to see all the details of how that, that request is made and how that response is displayed. It does not render it like a browser. It, if you make a call to a website, all you will see is the HTML. If you make a call to an API, all you will see is the JSON or the XML, but it allows you to, it works similar to a browser. It allows you to give, to make requests. It has tabs just like your browser, and it allows you to bookmark and save things and work with things, but it gives you more control than your browser does because your browser is, is meant to be limited and just for humans. Postman is meant for developers and non-developers who aren't afraid to look behind the curtain at what is happening on the web. So how are these APIs used? As I said, uh, you know, they're just a website, but meant to have just data. Oops, excuse me, went too fast. Uh, but increasingly, most of the website data you see, um, most of the information shown on a website, the images, the list of users are API driven. So when you land on a web page, a web application, it's probably making five or 10 different calls to APIs to get that information. And then it renders it as HTML so that the human can see it in the browser. But really uh, APIs came of age in 2008 with the introduction of the iPhone and then in 2009 and 10 with the Android phone. And so APIs over the last 10 years has been heavily used to build mobile applications. Every one of those applications on your phone uses APIs to talk to their, the company or the platform that's behind them. And so APIs are, are instrumental in making mobile applications do what they do for us and uh, as part of our personal and professional lives. Then around 2010, 2011, we started seeing more devices being connected to the internet. And these two were using APIs. So we have Fitbit, we have Nest, we have transit buses, uh, music devices, televisions, every device these days, if it's being connected to the internet, it's using APIs. And Postman is how you can look behind the scenes and understand what your TV is talking, what your uh, Alexa voice enablement uh, is doing. So APIs are not just for web and mobile, they are also for all of the devices that are being connected. Our automobiles, our cars now have APIs and uh, allow us to make calls to our car. Most of the car manufacturers today have public API programs that you can learn about APIs and understand how they work. So what, what, what became before APIs? That's hard because there's, there's a, many different types of APIs. And really, APIs have been around since the 1960s, since the internet was first created. And so as the information age began in the 1950s and 1960s, APIs were, were created in some form. Now, 
the, the API that we know today has evolved and come a long ways, but really the first API was created with the first network. Uh, I believe the first network was in 1958 with a, a military network, but by 1969 in the United States, at least there was uh, a small network that was started called ARPANET, which became the internet. And these, uh, the early ARPANET notes and uh, RFCs, as they call them, had designs for APIs. Then in the 1970s, there was a network called Electronic Data Exchange that was created. Now this used the phone lines. Um, it didn't rely on the internet as we know it today or a network, but it was a network that was created over uh, the telephone. And the EDI is still in use today. It's still a, a large portion of how uh, banks move data around, how large uh, commerce providers like uh, Walmart and Amazon move information around when it comes to commerce. And these were er, these are early uh, versions of the APIs. And you'll see there's EDI APIs that are modern REST or web APIs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. FTP, which began in the 70s, um, many of us use it to just move files around. It's the file transfer protocol. So you can upload uh, images to a server. You can uh, move files around. Many companies still use FTP as an API. They still use it to uh, put files, XML, JSON, tab separated, comma separated, which are technically APIs. You can then build uh, those data files into applications. Uh, FTP is still in use and it's still used as an API by many companies. But many people have, have learned there's, there's some flaws and, and some shortcomings when it comes to uh, how FTP works as an API. Email. Email has been uh, used as an API for many years. We, you, you and me send emails back and forth, messages uh, as humans, but many people use uh, email as an API to move around data between systems. So you have different applications checking email uh, to look for messages, and then they process those messages. So email is a form of an API that has been around for years, and it's still in use as part of many EDI systems and many banking and other systems. They just use messaging, SMTP, and POP protocols to move data around. So really, uh, email is an API. But really, everything changed with the World Wide Web starting in 1990 and then uh, growing throughout the 90s and changed how we move uh, data and information and other uh, digital content around. And this set into motion a new type of API, which we call Web API, or as was created in 2000, a REST API. But there are many different types of APIs out there. The one we focus on the most, the one that has the most popularity, is the web API, which is, as I showed you early on, is just an extension of the web. It's not anything special. It's just the, the next evolution of the web. <coughs> so what are some types of APIs? If you work in the enterprise, you will hear a lot about SOAP APIs. Uh, if you if you work in a startup or a smaller company, you'll hear that SOAP is dead. It's not an API that's used. But if you work in enterprise organizations, you'll know that SOAP APIs are still very much alive and still very much in use. And it's a, it's a very technical specification, but it is meant to move data between systems, um, between enterprise applications and servers. Um, it's It's generally not used for mobile applications but is a very business uh, and very technical uh, specification that you can build APIs with. <laughs> Representational state transfer, also known as REST, was created in 2000, but it did not get pop very popular until the mobile phone came out. 
but this is the most common version of the API you'll find today is called a REST API. And REST just uses the web to move data, images, and other content and data around the internet. And so, as I said, you can use FTP, you could use email. What's happened is since the web became so ubiquitous and available around the world, it became very cheap to use to move data around. And people started using it to power mobile apps and device apps, as I said. And it became the way that business gets done over the last 10 years. However, REST has some shortcomings and you will learn about other types of APIs like GraphQL, which is very database centric and very data centric. And if you're building apps like uh, using uh, modern frameworks like React, GraphQL is something, uh, a type of API that you will come across and put to use in your work. It's very data centric and data heavy. Uh, so you have to understand the schemas to put it to work but it's very powerful to allow you to rapidly build uh, applications and get access to data. But it tends to be a type of API that is just for developers where REST APIs, if you understand the web, uh, you can use REST APIs. There's another type of API called gRPC that has came out of Google. It is um, increasingly becoming a, an industrial grade API that is used to move uh, data from business to business in B2B environments. Um, it, and again, it's a, it's a very technical API. So it's really meant just for developers where REST APIs, again, um, can be simple enough for non-developers to put to use and play around with. But gRPC is a, is a very uh, commercial level type of API for moving lots of data around quickly and efficiently. And then another type of API you'll come across a lot is what's called WebSockets. These are real-time APIs. Usually with REST, SOAP, and GraphQL, you're making requests, you get a response back, and you're done. It works just like the web. You make a request to a web page, you get the web page back and the, the, the API request is done. With WebSockets, you make a request and it'll just send data back to you as it comes in and you can send data to it in real time. So WebSockets is a real time API specification. You tend to see it used in financial and other real time market based activities. So stock markets and trading. Um, one of the more popular ones recently is for Bitcoin and other blockchain style currencies. So uh, WebSocket is used for, for Bitcoin and, and just high volatility, high levels of transactions. And But you'll see it in gaming as well and other areas where this type of uh, rapid data exchange is needed to push data back and forth. So why should, why should these APIs matter to you? It looks like we got almost just shy of 100 people on here. I don't know a lot about you, but I can guess that some of you are developers. Some of you are, would like to be developers, but I'm hoping some of you um, are going to be in business functions. And APIs should matter to everybody. APIs are something everybody should be aware of, even if you're a non-developer. Uh, you should be aware of how they work. You should be aware that they're behind everything because APIs are powering everything in your personal life. Everything you do on your laptop, on your mobile phone, in your home, with your uh, home devices is done with APIs. And you should understand that they're there. You should understand that they can uh, be used and manipulated by, by you or by other people. Uh, and you should have an awareness that they are that they are right behind everything you are doing. They're powering everything in your professional life. So if you're aware of APIs, you will uh, gain an edge in your business, in your career, in what you're doing. APIs are behind everything that we do in our business world. And I'll walk you through a little bit of that here and, and demonstrate it, how it works. So... APIs, you can pretty much Google or search for anything that you use, any application, add the, the, the acronym API, 
and you will find their developer page. So if you are a Microsoft Teams user for messaging, search for the Microsoft Teams API and you can uh, see all the details of how to uh, access your, your Teams account and, and add channels, add messages and do different things with Microsoft Teams. Zoom, Zoom has an API. So if you're using Zoom for teleconferencing and, and presentations, there's an API that you can pull all your data. You can uh, manipulate Zoom and uh, channels, webinars, questions and answers, all the details that make up a, a Zoom platform. <clears throat> the entire Office suite has APIs. You can, if you are a Microsoft Word, a Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint user, you can use APIs to manipulate all of those documents using uh, any language. Google Calendar API, you can schedule, you can automate the scheduling. If you've ever used third-party apps like Calendly and other things that help you schedule, uh, those are all using the ca Google Calendar API to do what they do. Like, like Microsoft Office, Google Docs has an API, so you can actually add, update, delete files. You, you can manipulate them and put them to work. Um, you can, all the spreadsheets, Google Sheets has an API. You can manipulate spreadsheets, put data into it, and, and use it programmatically in any application. Of course, Twitter. Twitter is one of the more notorious APIs out there. Twitter has uh, everything we know about Twitter today has been built with the API. So when Twitter launched in 2006, it was simply an application that allowed you to sign up, follow friends, and tweet. Everything else was built on the API. They launched the API six months later, and, and it's built everything, all the mobile applications, all the buttons, the, the widgets, the, the hashtags, all of this came from the developer community. And so the Twitter API is a very popular API for understanding how, how all of this works. And it's a very relevant API to, to learn on because it's something that um, pretty much impacts all of us around the world. Facebook Graph API is similar. Um, you can manipulate most, almost everything about your, your Facebook profile using the Graph API. Um, and this is how a lot of automation and advertising and other things are happening. And the Instagram API now is now part of the Facebook family of APIs. So everything you do on Facebook, you can do programmatically using an API. WordPress, if you've ever installed WordPress as a blog, it's all available as an API. You can manipulate your blog posts, your pages, your themes, your templates, your images, all the resources available um, are, are available through a simple REST API again. These are all REST APIs. So they all just basically use the web to allow you to programmatically manipulate. Okay, I'm a developer, so less, enough enough presentation mode let's actually show you some of what we're talking about so that it can uh you can uh start playing with yourself as as you wish so let me go to my postman so you can find postman pretty easily just by going to postman.com if you haven't already downloaded it's pretty easy to download and you can just launch on the web if you don't want to download. But once you land in Postman, let me zoom in a little bit, make it a little bit easier for you to see. Um, there we go. Oops, maybe a little too big. So I've got a fresh workspace here. Um, I've got nothing in it. It's just giving me a lot of links and access to learn about what Postman does, um, see different things, understand I can take uh, tutorials. But what you need to know once you get going is this big orange button up here called new. So we're going to click on new and here you can start building APIs and doing different things. If you're a, a developer who knows how to build APIs, but if you just want to explore APIs, I recommend going to the API network. The API network is where you're going to find APIs for like Twitter for imager. If you're really into meme and image sharing, 
but you'll see there's a lot of different APIs here broken down by category. Uh, you can find many different APIs and all you have to do is just click on one of them and then you can run it in your Postman here. It'll let you just load it and start working with the Twitter API. <coughs> now, each of these will require you to do some authentication. Twitter just does not let you connect to their API for without uh, identifying who you are. But there are instructions here. If you view, if you, uh, let's go ahead and click on run in Postman here. And then we hit close. We should see the Twitter API here. And there's different uh, information available here. And there should be an environment up here for Twitter. If you click here, you're going to need to put in your keys and your tokens from your Twitter account. There's instructions on how to do it. Um, all you need to do is sign up for, for Twitter to, to get at it, but you will need to authenticate. And then you can make, begin searching and working with Twitter. But let's start with a simpler one than Twitter, because Twitter it does require you to have your own personal access. Let's go back here to the network. But rather than the network, I'm going to look at templates. Templates are much simpler, little, little single use case APIs. And many of these don't actually require authentication. Um, and I've created a couple here. Let's see. Now I have one public REST APIs. So this is one that I created to help people understand and learn about APIs. So you can click on this. And then again, you can choose to run in your Postman. And now I have what's called a Postman collection here with many different APIs that I can play with depending on my interests. And this is just a small sampling. I'm going to keep growing what's here. But if you're interested in cat facts, if you're a cat person, you can load a request to a cat fact API. You can hit send and I see JSON being returned. This uh, has different facts, um, cat, the goddess of beauty, but it's all in JSON. So you have to be able to work with this and manipulate it. You can save the data. You can write scripts if you're a programmer to manipulate the data, but it allows you to get at different types of information on the web. So if I'm not a, a cat person, if I'm a dog person, I can pull information on dogs, um, different types of breeds. If I'm interested in cars, I can find things on cars, on books, earthquakes. If I like Game of Thrones, there are APIs for everything out there. There are joke APIs, uh, random jokes. So anything that you are interested in, this API call will just give you a single joke every time you run the request. So this REST API collection, uh, public API, is a great place to start if you just want to start understanding what is happening and how to use APIs. Um, it's got lots of great things that'll get you interested. Pokemon, uh, space, if you're interested in following SpaceX launches, tacos, if you're interested in tacos, trivia, so I keep adding to this as I find new interesting APIs because I'm trying to find a way to, to make people interested in APIs um, and show them what's possible without authenticating and having to uh, do much more technical things. But once you're ready, Postman will um, allow you to authenticate using almost every format that an API will uh will require and so there's api keys there's there's tokens there's oauth one and two you'll come across all of these um, when it comes to learning about apis and so not all sadly not all of the apis i talk about are available in the network so you will be able to find quite a few here i think we've got almost three thousand and some of them are pretty popular like twitter but unfortunately Things like Google, uh, Microsoft Teams, they have a Postman collection, but they don't have it in the network. And so you'll have to go to their developer area and look for it. Same with Zoom. So if we go back to the browser here 
and you know you can you can try searching for Zoom API to find the API, but it also helps to add Postman if you're looking for a Postman collection. And so um, Zoom hasn't added their uh, Postman collection to the network, but they have a whole page dedicated to how do you authenticate, how do you use Postman, how do you uh, make it work. So they'll walk you through all of this on their site. And so sometimes you have to go look for uh, an API before you can find it. Um, you'll have to do some, some, some investigation and homework. But this is my job to try to get everyone publishing to the Postman network so that it's, it's one click to be able to put an API to work in your application. So that's consuming APIs. If you're looking to, to, to use APIs, there's many different ways you can, you can start using public REST APIs, using the Twitter API. But Postman also lets you build APIs if you're interested in taking data and making it available as one of these public APIs. Say you're interested in bicycle bikes, you're interested in books, and you want to build your own API, you can do that with Postman. And I have my work organized into different workspaces. I have personal workspaces and I have team workspaces. Um, and I will uh, organize different projects and I can even switch to different teams. I have several different teams that I'm part of when I actually build APIs. So I can um, go into my team here, choose my products API that I'm building here. And here's where I'm actually building an API. Let me zoom in again, because the screen can get pretty small. I have a products API here that I'm building and I've defined, I've documented it here. I've published documentation. Um, I've published testing for it. And so all the details of my API are here. I can make calls to it. I can see my products. This is just a fake one, but I can actually build my API here and put it to use and, and share it with other people. So I'm not going to go too much down this road, but I did want to quickly show that in addition to consuming APIs, you can build APIs. So there's two sides of that equation. And I recommend looking at some of the other features available in here. But at the very least, you should be using Postman as a browser. Like I said, it's got tabs, just like your regular browser. Uh, you've got URLs, just like you do in a browser. But most things that you do in a browser are just what's called a GET. This is an HTTP code. And Postman gives you access to all the other things that you can ask for of a, of a website or of an API. It lets you change all the parameters. It lets you handle all the authentication. And most critically, it gives you access to what's called the headers. And this is something that is behind every web page you ever loaded, but you never see this information. And that's what Postman excels at, is giving you access to this information that you wouldn't normally be able to see. And then you can manipulate your request and you can fully play around with and understand how your bot, the, the response works. And you can see how your, your network and your certificates are working or not working. Um, so there's so many different ways that you can manipulate and work with uh, an API. I'll show you another real quick thing that you can do with Postman that is really interesting for exploration is if I go here to my, my personal workspace, because I don't want to flood my, my professional one with this, is in a browser, I can go to any website, say, um, let's just go to Google News. I can, I have a, a extension a browser extension installed here called uh, for Postman. It's called Postman Interceptor. You can find this uh, in the Chrome App Store. But if I turn it on and then I go back to my Postman and I say, where's Interceptor? Here's Interceptor and I turn on in Postman and the, it's going to send the request to my history bucket, which is right over here. Well, I'll show you in a little bit. And then what this does 
is it just reverse it proxies all of the traffic that I make. So say I click on a, on this news link, I go here, or say I want to go to Facebook. You guys will get to look into my Facebook here for a little bit. Um, say I want to load Facebook and I want to actually post something to my Facebook. Um, I can say good morning because it is morning here. And I can go back to my postman, look at my history and you'll see it reverse engineered every web call that was made. It's, you see it's still coming in. So there's Twitter, Washington Post. Um, these are all API calls being made without me doing anything because Twitter just updates its status regularly. But if I scroll down, I can see Facebook should be down here somewhere. It's just flooding in. I can't really uh, make sense of it. But you can go back. <clears throat> You can choose to say, well, I'm gonna, I wanna filter. Um, I only want things that, um, you know, only only do facebook.com. Don't filter anything from any other domain. What this does is it allows you to reverse engineer the web and understand how the web works. And so you can uh, see how, there's a lot of APIs that Facebook has that they don't share with the public. And this is one way you can uh, look further look behind the scenes of what's going on and reverse engineer what is happening. And so Postman provides you through Interceptor this way to uh, reverse engineer the tools you're already using each day and understand how they work. So you can go to the network to find APIs. You can go to the API or the platform themselves like Zoom and Teams or you can reverse engineer the web that you already use. So you can turn on Interceptor and play around with the applications you use at work, and you can learn all about the APIs that they have behind the scenes. And with that said, I'm gonna stop sharing, and I'm gonna go back to my slide presentation. Let me see here. All right, oops, it started at the beginning. Oh, no, we're back here. Okay, so that concludes my demo portion of this. Hopefully that shows you a little bit about how all this works. Hopefully it shows you a doorway where you can start using Postman, whether you're a programmer or not. Notice I didn't write any code. I didn't do any programming. I'm just using Postman to understand the world already around me. So there's APIs you can play with to see how they work, even if you're not a programmer. But if you are a programmer, you can really see the potential of Postman in helping you understand what is happening. The Postman platform allows you to do quite a bit. It's, um, I consider it a Swiss army knife. It allows you to do many different things, uh, many different ways. And it's like that on purpose so that you can use it in, in however you wish. So just go in there and start playing. Um, you're not gonna break things. Uh, just play and understand how it works and you'll be introduced to many of these features. There's always a way to learn about how, how it works. So you can take a test drive, uh, the downloads page, just go to postman.com. Um, it's pretty easy to sign up. Actually, if you wanna download and not sign up, we have a free, uh, it, it's free for all developers, but you don't even have to sign up for account if you don't want to. Um, once you want to have start having access to more features, you'll need to sign up and uh, put in your information. But it's easy, it's easy to download and, and put to use. And with that said, I'll go ahead and, and open it up for questions and happy to answer any questions from the audience. Thank you. see here okay then uh, so there are some questions I guess yeah looking down some of them so why do companies share their API for free great question because when you see a free API you should always be skeptical there's always something going else going on so I would say it starts with why would someone have a, a, a a website that's free um, it's because usually there's there's some other business model usually with a website it's advertising 
you don't have advertising the same way with within APIs. So usually they're trying to get you to add data. They're trying to get you to, to create content, create images, create data and information for them. Um, another reason, there are many reasons why they would want it to be free, but another common one is they're looking for talent. So this is one of the, the secrets of APIs is they will put out their entire platform's APIs so that people build interesting things on them and then they hire those people or they acquire the projects that they built because they're interesting and they add value. And so if you're using the PayPal API, if you're using the Postman API, we are watching and we tend to see the people who are doing the most interesting things in the community and we hire those people. So there's many reasons why you would have a free API. But always understand if it's free, there's some other way they're making money. You just have to be more aware. Uh, nice webinar. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming there's going to be a recording. You guys will have a recording for this. Um, let me see. It just looks like general comments. I've been building a Flask REST API but integrating with the front end is becoming an issue. Your advice. Ooh. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, without knowing more about your API, it's it's difficult for me um, to give much advice. I would say um, make sure your API is standard, standardized. Flask REST should help you do that um, because the more standardized it is, this is why we have REST APIs, is that you can... Um, standardize it so that front ends have an easier time integrating with it and the more unique or the more custom your api is the harder it is for front ends to integrate with it so if you work if you work hard to make your api much similar to other apis in and how it works it makes it easier and how you do this is before you or as you're building your API, make sure you go out and play with other APIs, play with Twitters, play with Twilio, um, and see what are good patterns and what are bad patterns. And that'll help you become a, a better API designer. But there are also books and sites dedicated to good API design. Um, just Google it, and then that'll make it work with your front end better. But you know there might be other issues with your front end. Like I said, I showed you the different types of APIs. That's why I showed you REST will fail you at a certain point, depending on what you're trying to do. Sometimes a GraphQL API is better. Sometimes a WebSockets API or gRPC API is better. So depending on what your front end is, you're going to need different types of APIs. So it's, it's good for you to learn about all of them and understand. Um, really got interested in APIs. Amazing session. Well, thank you is postman free um yes it is so uh abhinav ankit and abhijit our co-founders are all developers they created postman to make their lives easier and they're very passionate about making sure it stays free so developers can use it in their world now we do have we do have to make money because we are a business so there are pro and team and enterprise tiers that allow you to pay and get more more access to uh, more resources. All the features in Postman are all free. It's just how much of those features you use and when you start charge, uh, paying for it. So depending on the volume of usage, you will start hitting points where you will have to pay. What is the learning track to master all resources and what are the learning resources? Whoa, heavy question. Um, well, <laughs> I recommend um, opening up Postman and just kicking the tires, playing with APIs. There's resources there on that homepage on the dashboard that I showed you that will that that are training and tutorials and take you to learn more. But really, Postman has we have 12 million developers now because it is a learning tool by itself. It teaches you to, to learn what an API is, how it works by playing with it, by being hands-on 
And that is the best way to learn about an API. You can go out and buy an API book. You can go to an API's documentation and read it. And you will not learn as much as if you just play with the API. So I recommend just playing. Um, the public API on GitHub is a good resource place to, for free public APIs. Yes, thank you. So there is, uh, there is actually quite a few, but the public public dash API is a really good resource. And that's actually where I started pulling that collection that I built. I use that repo to find a lot of those APIs. So the public dash API repo on GitHub is a great place to start and GitHub in general, look for APIs, follow the categories and, and, and uh, tags on GitHub and search. There are endless API projects on GitHub and many of them are open and usable. So what is the main prerequisite for starting work on APIs? Um, curiosity and no fear. So I'm, I'm serious about de non-developers being able to use Postman to, to play with APIs. I know people who are analysts, are data scientists, are salespeople. I know plenty of people who use it and don't know how to program. And so really the, the place, the, the major ingredient that you need to work with APIs is just to be fearless and, and not afraid to understand what's happening behind each of the web applications we use because even me and i've been doing this full time for for over a decade i still have to fumble around figure things out and that's why i, I use postman that's why i work at postman because i so believe in the tool and as part of my job and so you, you just got to be fearless you just got to dive into the apis and start using them um, what are the challenges teams face when many people use Postman? Well, that's a, so I gave a little bit of insight into showing that the personal or the team spaces. So Postman allows you to have your personal workspace and then you can have team shared workspaces where you can share your work. So if you build a collection for an API, you can share it with your team members and they can use it. So you're potentially saving each other time when you, um, when, you, when you use Postman in that way, you can mock APIs, you can run it. There's many different things you can do, but uh, make sure that you, uh, a lot of the challenges in that aren't in Postman, it's in your team. So the biggest problem organizations face when it comes to collaborating, sharing, uh, working together as a team on a single API is you don't have a space to do that. That's why we created workspaces. People don't have, uh, they'll have a, a request or a collection in their own workspace, but they're not sharing it with other teams. So we created sharing, but then you also end up where people overwrite your stuff and delete your stuff and you start hitting other friction with working with teams. And so, uh, so we created what's called role-based access control. So you can say these team members only can read only. They can't cha make changes. So there's a lot of features in there that'll help you understand how to uh, do more collaboration across your team, but also keep things a little safer. Um, how many, uh, should I keep going another five minutes here? I think another couple questions. Um, can you break into the system using APIs? Yes. <laughs> there are many security breaches with APIs. Um, and be careful, you know, using Interceptor. The line between hacking into a system and breaking into a system is pretty gray. And sometimes you will uncover things that you shouldn't have been. And uh, you got to be careful and you can get in trouble. But um, it's good to understand that line. I think every uh, developer, every technical professional should understand this line. And then I'll kind of move to the next question there. Are APIs secure enough? And between OAuth 2, just what should I prefer? No, I mean, most of the APIs I see out there are not secure enough. And OAuth 2 is great for not just securing access, but securing um, what what they have access, what resources. So OAuth 2 is a great way to secure that. 
and JWT um, has has certain benefits when it comes to I would say JWT is great in a distributed environment. Um, OAuth is great when you have user delegation, meaning you have users who are going to say yes, have access to my data or don't have access. So you got to just know your use cases and know your specs. It's and and depending on your project, each of those are going to uh, be used in different ways. But APIs are not secure enough overall. Most people build APIs for mobile applications and they think they're secure just because they secured their mobile application. But as I showed you with a uh, Postman Interceptor, you can proxy and reverse engineer any application. So um, it, it, people think they have private APIs because they're behind a mobile application. There is no such thing as a private API like that. If it's in a mobile app, it's public. So security is a big concern and you need to, uh, um, you need to understand more about APIs to, to be able to secure them. Um, one more question. Let me see. What should you do if an API is no longer available and your app depends on it? Yeah. Sorry, Abhishek. This is a pretty big common problem is unreliable APIs. That's why Postman exists is testing, debugging, making APIs reliable. Um, if, if there's no way to contact the person who owns the API, if there's no support, um, you probably not a lot you can do. And so, but in the future, every API you have and use and depend on in your app, you should have a plan B. You should have a second API that will um, be able to replace it. Now, you won't be able to do that in all situations because like the Twitter API, you can't replace the Twitter API. So there are exceptions to that, but APIs are notoriously unreliable. This is a big problem in the space. APIs change rapidly. They go away quite often. I mean, and this isn't, just a small company or small API provider thing. Facebook disappears APIs all the time. You'll be using it and then boom, it's gone one day. So um, I wish I could help here. There's just not a lot you can do. Um, I'll ask one, one last one. Um, are there parallels and differences between scraping and API? Oh yes, plenty. I would say most APIs, the data that um, they provide is acquired through scraping. And I actually use Interceptor, like I showed you, to actually scrape data. I will uh, turn it on. I will go browse through a bunch of sites. Now I have all that data in, in a collection. All I've got to do is parse through it with some scripts and pull out the data that I want. So I actually coined a phrase called scrape PI. And scrape APIs are a very common way of, of publishing data. Um, if you want to take a look at this, I, Postman has a, a COVID-19 resource center. You can just Google that. It comes up. On there, there's a handful of what I would call scrape APIs um, for pulling COVID-related data because a government agency didn't publish the data and I needed to scrape it. So... There's plenty of opportunities. Scraping is lots of fun. Um, I very much enjoy uh, APIs and scraping. So definitely there are lots of ways you can do both. And with that said, I'll close up the questions. Thank you guys. That's really great questions. And thanks for letting me talk, talk today. I appreciate you having me. Okay then. Uh... Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, then we'll be closing the meeting.